With Medico International and the Institute for the International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict, EFHV, IFHV, we have two excellent cooperation partners in which to realize this digital lecture series on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the UN Refugee Convention. I would also like to thank the Foundation for Environment and Development, North Rhine-Westphalia, and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for funding this project. Before we start, let me introduce you my colleague Jan Philipp Graf from IFHV, who is our technical support today. Thank you so much, dear JP. Well, uh, thank, uh, thanks to you, Bianca. As mentioned, uh, my name is Jan Philipp Graf, and I'm delighted to join you today from the Institute for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict at Ruhr University Bochum, where under the supervision of Professor Pierre Thielberger, our director, I'm working on my TA PhD project, uh, The Rights of Refugee Children Under International Law. As I have been working uh, on that topic for one and a half years now, I'm particularly excited to participate in today's session featuring some of the leading experts on this topic. But before we start, we would like to remind everyone that a Q&A session will follow after the presentation, so please feel free to type in any questions you might have into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens, and we will address your questions to the speakers in due course. For privacy reasons, given that the webinar is being recorded, we will not mention your names when we read out the questions. However, we look forward to all your questions and will try to answer them as good as we can. So today we will speak about children, children being refugees. The UNHCR documented for last year that 42% of the more than 84 million people who were forcibly, forcibly displaced are children. And as refugees and most vulnerable group, they face a lot of dangers. Often they get separated from their families. Being alone, they often become survivors of human rights violations and man-made disasters, disasters. They experience exploitation torture, human trafficking, kidnapping, sexualized violence. As refugees, they risk their lives while trying to cross the sea to reach the EU. They may die of hunger and are deprived of their fundamental human rights to health care and education. There are a lot of reports about the detainment of children as refugees, a further traumatic experience and violation of their rights, as we can observe on the Greek islands or also at the Belarusian, Belarusian and Polish border. This is why we decided to hold a special session on the situation of children being refugees, and we are excited to discuss with the following experts. Jason Popjoy is an expert on international law, working as a barrister with Blackstone Chambers in London. He is the author of one of the leading monographs on the topic, The Child in International Refugee Law, published with Cambridge University Press in 2017. His research, research focuses on child-specific interpretation of, refu of the refugee definition and the relation between the Refugee Convention and international human rights law, especially with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Jacqueline Baba has a long academic career. Baba started her career as a human rights lawyer in London and at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Currently, she's professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Harvard School of Public Health, lecturer in law at Harvard Law School, and an adjunct lecturer in public, public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Her work also focuses on transnational child migration, refugee protection, children's rights, and citizenship. She edited various books on this topic and is author of the book, Child Migration and Human Rights in a Global Age. And last, but certainly not least, we have Professor Lenny Benson. Lenny Benson is a professor at New York Law, law School, where she has been teaching and writing in the field of immigration law for decades. She is the Distinguished Chair of Immigration and Human Rights Law at New York Law School. She also founded the Safe Passage Project, which recruits, trains, and mentors attorneys to assist unaccompanied youth who are facing deportation. With more than 500 pro bono attorneys, the Safe Passage Project is currently assisting over 1,000 unaccompanied minors in New York. Lenny will also explain the situation at the US Mexican border 
where tens of thousands of unaccompanied children have been arriving each year, where they are systematically detained and deprived of their human rights. In 2018, she published the collection Protecting Migrant Children in Search of Best Practice, which she edited together with Mary Crock of the University of Sydney in Australia. So we are very exciting to hear your expertise and we are going to start with Jason Portroy. I hand over to you. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, and um, I'm particularly delighted to be here uh, today and this afternoon with, um, uh, with, with Jackie and Lenny, both, both of whom um, have inspired my own work um, and uh, and have, have done some really, really terrific stuff. So I was particularly um, honoured to be um, invited alongside two such eminent um, academics and practitioners working in this field. What, what, what I got asked to speak about uh, was, um, was some of the key challenges facing refugee children. And, and I'm going to do that uh, based both on my... Uh, experience as an as an academic um, uh, uh, who has done kind of a, a very extensive case law review of some of the um, uh, common law jurisdictions, but also based on my experience as a practitioner. So I work as a barrister in London and uh, work on a lot of immigration and, and refugee cases. So uh, I thought I could give some insight and some examples from that work as well. And there, there were four key challenges which I wanted to highlight. And I should say, and I should preface this by saying that I, I see these as kind of key, some of the key legal challenges that, that, um, that uh, kids face. There are, there are others on this call who are a far better place to talk about some of the broader challenges. But these are some of the legal challenges that I've, um, I've had to deal with and that I've seen in, in terms of children navigating um, the legal processes for gaining access to refugee status, gaining access to, to refugee rights uh, once they arrive in a host state. It goes without saying that refugee children face many other challenges in their search for protection. So the first challenge is invisibility. Uh, and when I first commenced my research almost 12 years ago now, uh, I, I was... Um, really surprised at the very small number of cases uh, concerning refugee children. And there was a real tendency in the case law to focus on the situation of the parents, for instance. So you would have a case, um, and this was particularly true in the United States, you'd have a case involving um, a child at risk of female uh, genital cutting, for instance, and it was all analysed through the potential risk of harm to the parents. So uh, a parent uh, at risk of seeing their child uh, subjected to this form of uh, treatment. Or there are many cases where uh, your where decision makers just look at the, the parents' claim and there's no mention at all of, of the children and whether uh, children may well have an independent claim for protection. So uh, the, the, the same issues are here in the UK. I did, I did a really horrific case involving a Nigerian family where uh, the, their, the mother had uh, a mental illness um, and uh, a view was taken that the child was in danger. And so the child was, put into, was taken away from the mother and put in uh, foster care. At the same time, the mother was going through uh, a refugee status determination process. Um, and that, and uh, that, that process was effectively stayed while the child was in foster care. And I think after about two years um, with lots of counselling and lots of reports from social workers, the child was returned to the mother um, because of a whole bunch of safeguarding me mechanisms had been put in place, including at the child's school, including that the foster parents were going to stay closely involved. And within literally weeks of um, the child being returned to the mother, uh, the Home Office took a 
asylum decision and, and refused that asylum decision for the mother and deported um, both the mother and the child to Nigeria. And we made an application, an urgent application, um, trying to get a mandatory order compelling the UK government to bring them back. Now, it's one thing to try to stop a deportation. It's quite another to try to get an order to bring them back. Uh, um, but we did it on the basis that there was no independent consideration uh, of whether or not the child had an independent claim to protection, either under the Refugee Convention or um, applying, um, and because this does have force in the UK, which I appreciate is different to the United States, for instance, but, but or failing to consider the best interest of the child, which is a, which is a mandatory requirement under UK law, um, given that we have, we have implemented um, domestically that part of the Convention on the Rights of the Child as it applies to kids. So, uh, but we were ultimately successful in, in obtaining that order on the basis that uh, that child had been rendered invisible. Uh, I intervened on behalf of the Office of the Children's Commissioner, uh, uh, putting in submissions based on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, based on the dangers of invisibility, and tried to apply rights-based framework um, using various provisions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child to argue uh, that, that one can't go through this process without shining a spotlight on the child as well. And, and that was the basis upon which we, we, we obtained that mandatory order. It, so it, it's still a huge problem. There's a great case, I don't, there's a great case from earlier this year in the Supreme Court that I was involved in here in the United Kingdom about um, the relationship between the Refugee Convention and the Hague Convention process in, in cases involving the induction of child of children. And, um, and again, that looks at this issue of invisibility of children as well. So that's, if anyone that's interested, um, it's case of, uh, the case of G from early this year. So invisibility, a, a key problem, um, and, and it still is a big problem uh, here, certainly here in the UK, and, and, um, and, and I imagine that's right in many other jurisdictions. The second issue is um, incorrect assessments. And, and what I mean by that is, is, is incorrect assessment of uh, protection status, whether it be refugee protection or some other form of complementary protection. So when you shine a spotlight on a child, so if you get past that invisibility hurdle, um, decision makers um, uh, just don't know what to do with that claim or don't know how to um, consider that claim in a child-friendly way. Now, this is something that Jackie has done a huge amount of um, uh, work on, and, and I sought to um, uh, draw on some of that in my book and um, and we've, we've, we've seen I think probably in the last 10 to 15 years um, uh, uh, increased amount of case law uh, that starts trying to do this starts trying to look at how one can apply the refugee convention in a way that acknowledges um, and has regard to the fact that the individual claimant is a child, so will be at, be at risk of different forms of persecutory harm, that may be at risk of um, forms of harm uh, um, in circumstances where an adult would not be um, at risk of persecutory harm. So, so we are making inroads, but it is still um, it is still a, a huge problem, um, in my view, faced by, by children trying to claim uh, asylum. The third is the realisation of rights once, um, well, realisation of rights both during the determination process, so detention is a huge issue, um, the detention of children, um, but also the realisation of rights once they obtain refugee status. There's a huge problem um, in terms of uh, children obtaining some form of durable solution because very often once they obtain their refugee status, particularly unaccompanied children, they're just left, left in this kind of form of um, limbo. Uh, another big issue in terms of the realisation of rights for uh, refugee children is the issue of family reunion. And this is something I've been working on a lot over here in the UK for the last three or four years uh, because we have quite a draconian um, policy whereby if you were if you if you come here as an adult and are recognized as a refugee 
you have a, pr a pretty close to automatic rise to bring your children over um, from your home country. When I say close or not, you know, there, there are certainly things that you have to do and you have to show that you can um, financially support and that, um, that, that they are your children, etc. But but they are, uh, it is a relatively easy and straightforward route. For a child, um, there's no such route. It's, it's the, 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 there is no mechanism by which if you're a 13 year old child that has, that has come here as an unaccompanied minor, um, and have, has been granted refugee status, you have no uh, formal mechanism to seek to bring your parents over. Um, uh, and the policy reason that is given for that, although it's completely unevidenced, is a concern about anchor children. So parents sending their kids over here to, um, uh, so as to bring their parents over um, later. Now we have a we have a, a challenge on foot at the moment, trying to to challenge that policy on the basis that it's inconsistent with um, international law and rights of the child, and and that it's discriminatory under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article fourteen. Uh, that there is one route that's available, um, uh, kind of that that uses the notion of exceptionality. Uh, an extremely high threshold that must be met and they, it's called kind of, and it's based on article 8 right to family life under the European Convention of Human Rights and if you if you satisfy a very high threshold of exceptionality uh, you may be you may be able to get your parents uh, over here um, they call it kind of outside the immigration rules um, and I'm going to come back to that in a second but but that's the third challenge and then the fourth I've just written down here just rhetoric and and I think that's a real issue here, uh, particularly um, at the moment with our current government. So um, when I um, wrote the book, and I think I may have actually cited Jackie on this, on, 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 on this, this point, it's, it's that children are um, uh, often treated as migrants before they're, refugee children are treated as migrants before they're treated as kids. And, um, but, but, but in fact, refugee children are of course kids first, and we need to put them through the prism of their childhood rather than thinking of them um, as a migrant. And that's really important. But we've gone one step further here. And it's not now just that um, refugee children are migrants, it's that they're illegal migrants. And this concept of illegality really permeates a lot of the policies um, that the UK government are coming up with at the moment. And some of you might be aware that there is a, there's a bill currently before Parliament here which is effectively, um, it, it seems like they have done a review of all of the, um, uh, the worst policies from all around the world and combined them into a single piece of legislation. So we have everything, we have everything in there, offshore processing, um, penalization of, ref of, of any refugee that doesn't arrive here via Kind of illegal group, but by which I think they just mean resettlement. So basically, every refugee that arrives um, by boat, we're looking at reintroducing um, X-rays for age assessments. Um, uh, we are um, uh, introducing a power to physically push back um, boats of migrants in the middle of the channel, even if it's children. Uh, and we've got a, uh, um, uh, and we we have we 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 have a challenge at the moment on foot to challenge that policy on the basis that it's contrary to the right to life and right to be protected from cruel and degrading treatment and also flatly inconsistent with the refugee convention which applies um, uh, will, will apply the minute you kind of engage with someone um, on the sea and so if they are making a claim for protection as 98% of small boat arrivals do, um, then, then you have to assess that claim um, before you use a jet ski to, um, to, to, to push them back. So that, I think that rhetoric is a real, is a, is a real issue. Um, I just want to give an example of a case and, and only because I had some very good news last night and it, it actually addresses um, or provides a good illustration of quite a few of these. Um, these issues um, and these, these hurdles. Uh, it was a boy who fled um, from Afghanistan when he was 12. And 
uh, and after a two year journey arrived in the United Kingdom uh, as an unaccompanied minor. He had fled after his father had been killed by the Taliban and he was worried that the same would um, occur to him. So he left his mother and siblings behind and he arrived. Um, so he's 14 when he arrived. Um, he's the first thing that the, um, the government did was dispute his age. And so he went through an age assessment process. Um, he was found as part of following that process, he was found to be 16 rather than 14, um, which, uh, which caused huge problems once he turned 16 because he was taken out of care um, at the child's home and was put into adult accommodation. Uh, the, uh, he was refused asylum. Um, that that um, was then upheld by the first tier tribunal. Eventually, after three years, he, his claim for asylum was ultimately granted by, um, uh, he had to make a, a, a fresh application based on new evidence, and it was upheld um, by the first tier tribunal after being rejected again by the Home Office. Um, the first tier tribunal judge uh, noted in his judgment that, that, that he will need significant support for some time if he's to stabilise and having read the reports, I have no doubt that therapeutically he urgently needs to be re reunited with his mother whom he both misses and worries about in equal measure. So that was 2019. I got involved at that point to try to secure, um, uh, to secure family reunion for his parents. Um, uh, we applied under this exceptional um, exceptional circumstances route um, after a very huge number of delays um, that was rejected, applied to the tribunal, was, it was initially resisted. And then last night, um, we, we had a communication um, that um, it had now been reconsidered and, um, and family reunion was going to be granted for the entire family and they're all all going to be granted entry shortly. So fantastic results, but look at the process. He's, he's 19 now. He arrived here when um, he was 14. He's had five years, basically a huge chunk of his childhood without his mum. And, and that just shows that um, uh, huge issues, obtaining refugee status, huge issues in terms of the realisation of rights during um, he's, 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 he's doing the assessment of his claim um, and then difficulty securing, securing uh, the, the right to be with his family uh, after his claim was granted. So huge problems, um, lots to be done. Um, and uh, I, I think it's great that, that we're having conversations like this to, 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 to share the experiences that we're having um, in different jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. So what a struggle, what a fight. So Jacqueline, perhaps you can explain a little bit to us why children are in such a bad situation globally when they when, when, when they become a refugee um, and an unaccompanied minor refugee, where they stand alone and are the most vulnerable persons <laughs> and, uh, among the refugees. So please. Perhaps you can explain that a little bit more to us. Yes, uh, thank you, Bianca, and thank you, JP. And uh, I echo what uh, Jason just said. One of the silver linings of COVID is that one gets to meet with one's colleagues and friends more frequently, albeit virtually, than we maybe otherwise would have without all the hassle of jumping on and off planes. So really, thank you very much to both of you for organizing this, this interesting and important conversation and you know, for marking uh, this very significant piece of international law that is the Refugee Convention and I think we probably all have a few things to say about that but I know you're going to ask us about that later so I'll hold off on those comments. So I think Jason did a, a fabulous job of highlighting you know some of the key issues um, that are relevant to our topic. Maybe I could just start with the observation that um, your title Children on the Run is both catchy and powerful but in some ways also inaccurate because alas many of these children are not what you would by any description called on the run these are long tortuous journeys and Jason just gave us this example 
um, of, of, of the Afghan boy, you know, who's, yeah, as he rightly said, much of his childhood has been, has been robbed, really, and um, you can't regain that. And we know from, you know, neurobiology and the work of, of neuroscientists that early trauma, sometimes called toxic stress, um, can be irreversible. So I don't want to be too um, alarmist about this, but for those of you who are interested, and I know Bianca, you work in the psychosocial field and maybe some of our, of our audience also do, work of, of colleagues like Jack Shonkoff, my colleague here at Harvard and others have, has looked in, at the enduring, and as I said, sometimes irreversible impact of toxic stress on children. So this is not just a bad experience, which then you get over. It's not like the first day of school or having an illness. These are kind of nearly positive stress or normal stress, you know, and you overcome it. But the experiences of many of these children are really are life changing. So and so this idea of on the run is is um, it captures the danger, it captures the displacement, maybe it also captures the sense of loss of home, which is so powerful. Um, but what it doesn't capture is the duration and the experience of multiple hurdles, the elusiveness of safety, the sense that uh, you are living in limbo for so long and that the permanence, which we all know is so important to children, um, that that permanence is, is, so, is so lacking for so long. So that really is the first point I wanted to make that these children are on the run, but they are also walking, staying, blocked, detained, waiting, waiting, waiting endlessly. And I know Lenny will, will have more to, to say about that. Um, the second point I want to make, which really answers your question, I hope, Bianca, but also kind of builds on what Jason so eloquently said about invisibility. So in my book um, that Jason kindly referenced, which I wrote now, you know, over 10 years ago, I'm, I'm actually as old as the refugee convention, dare I say, it's so quite old. Um, um, in my book, I talk about um, this notion of invisibility and I question it, even though I think it's very true. And I know my own early experience of doing research kind of in dusty libraries in London at entities like JCWI and other NGOs that work with refugees. My own experience was also just seeing how children disappeared from the asylum decisions. But I think it's sometimes more complicated than just invisibility. And I now think, you know, we live in a post, for those who remember, you know, Elian Gonzalez, Alan Kurdi, of course, era. So I don't think children are actually that invisible. And of course, you know, in the kind of semi-pornography of the news, children are always the images that are captured. So it's a complex tango between invisibility and what I, kind of tried to call ambivalence. So, you know, we partly willfully don't see children, but we partly willfully also ignore these children, as opposed to other maybe more deserving, more legal, more credible children. And so I think this is kind of where our legacy of, you know, now we all rightly talking about it, of, of being in a post-colonial situation of being really imbued in our laws with racism that's where these issues still live that some of these children we we are ambivalent about them um jason quite rightly mentioned age determination which is of course a huge issue in this field um and the basic point about age determination is you think children are lying you think that they're telling a lie when they say they're as in the example jason gave the boy says he's 14 no we think we're not sure you might be over 18 and then we test and our tests which are very flawed suggest that you know the age is different so we don't believe these children we think they're liars we don't trust them and we actually don't even think they're that deserving of the sort of care that we think other children merit so we um, think of these children actually in some ways like juvenile delinquents. They're liars, they're not good actors, they are deceitful. In many cases, they're older than they seem. And even if they aren't older because of the life experience they've had, 
they are actually older. They're older than our little children because, you know, they've had rough lives. They've had to fend for themselves. They've dealt with war. And so they don't really need these protections. And I think this is partly what's informing the enormous cynicism and cruelty that we see. So it's not just inv invisibility. It's not just a question of us as, as advocates drawing attention to solve the problem, even when we draw attention we still find these attitudes enduring. I mean, Lenny has been working for many decades on these issues and we still have children being separated from their families and we still have children in detention and no sensible person in America could claim that they don't know that there are lots of child uh, children who are at risk. No, nobody could honestly say that. Maybe, you know, 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, when I started this work, people were kind of incredulous when I told them about children locked up. People said, really, we do that here? Yeah? But now I don't think anybody could honestly claim not to know about this. Um, so I think that's that's the point I want to make. Um, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the fact that the Refugee Convention is age neutral. So the Refugee Convention, and maybe we'll come back to this, doesn't specify age at all. There's no lower limit, there's no upper limit. Um, like many other issues that we now focus on, sex, gender, sexuality, it's silent about this. Um, so, and this is a more technical legal point, um, age, being a child is not a ground of persecution, just like being a woman isn't or being LGBT isn't. Does that matter? Um, and I would say yes and no. Um, of course it's mattered uh, over the decades that, um, children weren't kind of front and center because it has contributed to this neglect, whether we call it invisibility or willful neglect, it certainly contributed. And I'm so glad that Jason made the really critical point about the asymmetry in the right to family reunification, the kind of paradox that adults who don't depend on their children in that way can bring their children, but children who really do depend on their parents can't bring their parents. It's, it's, it's just insane if you think about it. And I first encountered this many, many years ago with Vietnamese boat children, you know, incredible trauma that these children had been through. And finally um, they had survived against the odds. And then they were told that, you know, Oh, it was just all a ruse, you know, Jason meant, mentioned the term anchor children. It was all a ruse just to get the families in so the families could work. Well, what rubbish. These children um, critically needed their parents to kind of try to deal with the accumulated trauma. So this asymmetry of rights is, I think, also, um, to some extent, it is one of the reasons why the absence of any explicit mention of children in the, in the convention is important. Um, I also think that um, there, the, the, the assumptions about children's credibility, about the reliability of children's testimony, maybe um, those negative assumptions are also to some extent related to the fact that the Refugee Convention doesn't fair and kind of center um, identify them as, as legitimate claimants. You know, and of course, one of the important points here, I think, is that, you know, the category of child in international law from zero to 18 is, of course, an enormously diverse category. You know, um, when you compare a, a two year old to a 17 year old, they're very, very different animals. And so different rules need to apply. Different standards need to apply. That's not to say that very young children can't be credible. And there is, you know, and Jason's book has this in it beautifully. There's, there's very good case law of some sensible judges saying, of course, children remember things, terrible things that happen, even when they're very young. And maybe I can just share, Jason shared this lovely story about the Afghan boy. I can unfortunately share a terribly sad story about Afghan children that I just heard this morning, um, which is, and some of you may have heard on the news, these terrible kind of um, killings and rapes and persecution by the Taliban against women and, and feminist activists, and just not even activists, women teachers and others who've had the courage to demonstrate, you know, in the early days of the, of the takeover. So um, we've been very involved, many people have, in, in trying to help people to get out who are clearly at risk. 
and there's this case that I just heard today of a woman a family where the, the woman was one of these brave, you know, feminists um, with, I think, four or five children and a, uh, and a husband and she and two of her children were murdered. Um, we just heard this. Um, I, I just heard this this morning. Um, and so, you know, here we have the surviving husband and two other children. They will never forget this day, however small they are. And if there comes a time when they are able to claim asylum and talk, the fact that they were only three or four should not be held against them. They will never forget this terrible day. So the point here is really about, about credibility and um, the importance of listening to children and the, their ability to be absolutely reliable witnesses. So these are some of the reasons why I think the exclusion of children in the Refugee Convention has had an impact and has had an enduring impact, which we are still trying to counter. On the other hand, I don't think we should overstate that. There has been um, progress and the fact that, that children are not explicitly identified in the Refugee Convention as you know, a category hasn't prevented children from getting refugee status and getting protection you know from you know people who are now also wonderful advocates like Lenny and, and, and Jason are, are, are continue to win cases and the jurisdictions of courts has kind of expanded and the jurisprudence is also now more capacious so we have all sorts of what some of us have called child specific persecution ideas that are now kind of accepted you know, children who have survived incest, children who've been recruited as child soldiers. There are many child specific harms which inform decision making. But of course, as everything, it's not black and white. There are many very child specific harms, and I'm sure Lenny will talk about this, which still continue um, to be excluded uh, from clear refugee protection, you know, and in the Central American case, we're talking a, a lot about children who are recruited or targeted by gangs, um, which is an enormous life-threatening danger. And it is unconscionable and in some ways inconceivable that that still should be a battle and that the courts should still say that children who are at risk of their lives by refusing to join gangs should not qualify for refugee status. So, um, so yes, there have been negative consequences of, of the gender, uh, of the um, age neutrality, but I think we don't want to exaggerate them. Let me just um, make a couple more points and then I'll, I'll stop so that we also have time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, the problems that, uh, you know, children who are forced to leave their homes have, of course, are not just legal, though we know the legal problems are very significant. They are much broader than that. And let me just mention a couple. The whole question of nutrition, vaccination, healthcare, the basic building blocks of um, a healthy, um, you know, life where you can enjoy your well-being physically and mentally, those building blocks are often denied. So um, when you're living, you know, precariously in refugee camps, when you are moving from place to place, when you are being cared for uh, by parents who might be se severely depressed um, or abusive, you know, pushed to the edge and violent, when you are not even with parents, when you're unaccompanied, um, your access to these basic things, like just think about food, think about milk for babies, you know, um, think about, as I say, vaccination, uh, or think about other critical things like birth registration, documents to prove your identity, which in later life will be critical for schooling, will be critical for traveling, it'll be critical for getting scholarships, it'll be critical for your building your life. All those are enormous problems, you know, which then relate to other more complex issues like statelessness. So that's one point. Secondly, school. School and education are critical tools for building a rights respecting life. We know we live in an information crazy, mad society. If you lack education, not even just basic literacy and numeracy, but if you lack a certain quality of education, 
you will face a very low glass ceiling in your career prospects. So even if you overcome the trauma of dislocation and the disadvantages of racism and not speaking the language and so on, even if you overcome all those advantages, because you're one of these super resilient kids of which there are so many, the fact of having a fractured, inadequate, inconsistent, interrupted education is going to have an enormous impact on your life chances. And we see that again and again. And let me just give two quick examples. One, um, the situation of Rohingya children. So these are children part of the you know, massive exodus of, of, of persecuted Rohingya, Muslim uh, uh, refugees from Myanmar, who now for years have been living in the um, refugee camps called Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. Um, these children have no right to access um, Bangladeshi schools. They have no right to have regular schooling in the refugee camps. There are so-called learning centers, which are really an approximation, very minimal level of education. And then there are some madrasas organized by the community. But most adolescents have no education at all. Um, and many of the younger children don't either. And this is an enduring situation. So just imagine what this means for the future of this already embattled community. Um, we're not doing that much better with many of the refugees who've made it to Europe. And I'm sure you, you Europeans, <laughs> um, you know, know about the situation in Lesbos, which I know, I'm sure several of us have, have visited many times. And, you know, there, there are no schools, there's no schooling. I mean, children have been there for years now. Um, and even when there is schooling, like in Athens, it's, it's very inadequate, it's very poor. So this is a whole, um, again, there are some wonderful work being done now by colleagues, including colleagues that I have here, here at Harvard, but also people in UNHCR are really thinking through carefully, what does refugee education mean? Because if education is partly educating you for the future, what future are you educating these children for? And if education is also history, for example, reflecting on your past, how much we know about what these children have learned and haven't learned. So there are very specific issues here of education, I think, that are that are important. My last point um, is a more general point about um, the com complete sort of dereliction of duty on the part of all of us, of the international community, of member states in particular, states that pride themselves on their humanity and on their human rights record, the dramatic dereliction of duty to have a non-discriminatory approach. You know, the kind of starting point of human rights, and of course the Refugee Convention too, but even the kind of covenants, the human rights covenants, is one should not discriminate. One should not discriminate on the basis of your civil or political status or your legal status, whether you're regular or irregular, whether you are, you speak the language or not, etc. And yet we continue to discriminate in the most explicit and shameless way again and again. And I think this is something that we maybe don't call out enough. We, we don't, you know, we seem to live in societies where the criminalization of children just because they're trying to survive and, 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 and have a life um, is accepted. We live in situations where if you don't have the right legal status, you, you know, you have difficulty accessing healthcare, having somebody attend if you have an earache. I mean, how is this possible? So I think that um, it's great that you're celebrating, that we're celebrating the Refugee Convention, because that represented a moment of humanity. But I think we really have our work cut out for us moving ahead. So let me let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for these words. So let's continue with Lenny, who can give us very, very concrete uh, de um, descriptions of the situation of children being refugees in the US. So uh, thank you all for hosting me. Um, those of you watching from Europe can see it's morning in New York uh, and the sun is coming through my kitchen window. That's actually gonna be good because I cannot see myself speaking to you right now. <laughs> Hopefully you won't be distracted too much by the shadows. I apologize if it is disruptive. I want to take us just for a framing moment uh, back to the beginning of that refugee convention 
and some of the motivation. It's a complex story, of course. But a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to see a Swiss film called The Boat is Full by the director Imhof. And I don't speak German, but I believe it's Das Boot ist Voll. It was an Academy Award nominated film. And it, it tells the story of a bundle of people arriving by train before the tunnels are shut between Switzerland and uh, Germany. And the ragtag group hides in a farmhouse. And you see the family in the farm and the pastor in the community trying to figure out how to help the people in the farmhouse qualify to remain safely in Switzerland. And one of the things they learn is that uh, it may be that if someone has a child that is young and of tender age, maybe that adult could stay. And there is a grandfather and a granddaughter that are traveling. They're Jewish, they're escaping the persecution, but there's also a young soldier that has fled and they experiment with, could they make the soldier her father? And he's too young. That film in the first 20 minutes, and I do recommend it, I, I don't know if it's available on streaming, but I have, I own a VHS copy myself. I do recommend thinking about this concept in law of wherever we draw the categories of protection, the people in the world, well-meaning advocates, the individuals themselves, will try their best to uh, take advantage of the protections that are offered. While all might be desperate, we draw so many lines in our offering of protection that uh, we, we know it's, it's simply inalienable going to be, people are going to, some will qualify and some will not. So let us talk about the US context and see how some of our complementary protections and generous protections and our unique uh, large country, 9,000 miles of border, 350 million people, 11.5 million of those people without any status in the United States. How that context of our law and our refusal to regularize the population that has been here for decades has created some of the pull factors that we're experiencing most dramatically. Now, by, by talking about this, I do not mean in any way to say many of the people are not refugees and I will come back to that. But I do think the US context in part, like in all of our nations, is also part of our, our overall socioeconomic status, our mobility in our society, uh, the family that is already here. And while uh, the boat is full was about the period of World War II, this is an old story. This is, an, this is you can even find examples in the Bible. Why is uh, Moses and his mother and his sister putting the baby in the bulrushes in the river Be to escape the edict of death to the children? Parents, families, siblings, children themselves are often motivated by this life or death threat. But they are truly also motivated in a desire to reunify. So, let me give you a picture of our Southwest border right now. Last year, and the fiscal year in the United States is the data I have. So this ends as of October of 21. 122,731 unaccompanied children were apprehended on our Southwest border. Let me say the number again, 122,000. The prior year, there had only been 15,000. What is the difference? In politics, some would say, Mr. Biden has opened the border and therefore people are coming to the border and these children are crossing the border because they believe they will be well received and, and welcomed by the democratic executive branch of government. That, that last year of the Trump administration was so low because people knew the border was tougher. This number only reflects the young people 
who were able to be referred to be counted. The last year of the Trump administration, children were summarily excluded until litigation stopped the process using the COVID healthcare protocols. So that disparity of the 15,000 to 122,000, if you look at this as a snapshot, you think, oh, there must be some reason there's a new cascade of people seeking protection, or there's a new reason children are on the move. That number was so low because people knew the law was tough. It's much more complex than that. And another fundamental change between the two branches of government, the law itself really didn't change, but the policies and administration of who could be even accepted at our border were that family units, mothers, fathers, mothers and fathers traveling with children were also being subjected not only to COVID expulsion, but to a new program that may be authorized by our statutes, it's unclear, that if you arrive at our contiguous Southwest border, our government can take your information and tell you you must wait in Mexico to have a hearing later in the United States. And the families in those desperate situations along the Northern border of Mexico where organized crime controls much of the territory. And the Mexican government was not well prepared and actually quite angry at the implementation of this process by the Trump administration. Parents soon learned by word of mouth or experience that if children went alone, they could cross. And parents had to make that difficult choice again. So it is a conflagration of policy motivated people, the COVID pandemic, and to be honest, the, the climate changing conditions in Central and South America, adding to the normal flow of children who needed security, protection, and stability. Again, the children that are apprehended primarily at the Southwest border come from three nations. Honduras is the largest, sorry, sorry Guatemala is the largest with 47% of all the unaccompanied children. Honduras is second with 32%. The government statistics say only 1% of those children taken into custody are from Mexico. That is because our Congress, our statutes allow summary, summary refusal. Even if a child might have a claim for refugee protection, the only screening the border officials offer a child from Mexico is, are you a victim of trafficking? And of course the children may not even understand what that concept is. And empirically we know from interviewing the children when they return to Mexico, they're really never even asked. There's no accountability, there's no judicial oversight, there's no transparency. 7% of the children taken into custody this last year were from all the other nations of the world. And that is because some children do also arrive at our Northwest border, but our government doesn't report those statistics. So they're, they're not e easily trans, uh, we can't read them easily. How many children are apprehended on our Canadian border? How many children at our airports? How many children found inside our interior who may have entered surreptitiously or very commonly with visas and then have overstayed their visas and become children on their own? Let me just give you an example of that context. Often African children or families have some means they may mortgage their own homes or raise capital to send their child on a soccer field trip where they're hoping, or football as you say in Europe, uh, that the young person will be scouted to become a professional footballer in the United States. I don't know how it is that these excursions are ever approved by our US consular staff abroad, but there are groups of young men primarily who are coming with sports teams or to do an exhibition or to come on an adventure trip. And then the minute they're here, they're abandoned into the labor market. 
we meet these young men as bicycle messengers. We meet them on the football field, playing pickup games for calf. We meet them in our schools because unlike many nations of the world, our country does say that your status does not bar the first 12 years of education. In some cities, there is such open hostility to these children, status is ignored. Sometimes one could say it's benign neglect, leave it alone. But of course, that also means those children receive no services. But in cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, there's a movement toward trying to connect the children in the schools with some kind of immigration legal assistance to help them regularize their status. And again, we do have paths to regularizing your status even when you're in the interior. Our asylum process and something called special immigrant juvenile status. So let me make sure you know what this is because it is really um, extraordinary. Both our asylum status and our special immigrant juvenile status ultimately lead to permanency, permanent residence in the United States, and five years later can lead to full citizenship. So we don't leave people in a limbo for all of their lives. Of course, it's a lot of paper. It's a lot of bureaucratic process. People do usually require legal assistance, which is difficult to find because it's not provided free by, as a matter of law. But what is the special immigrant juvenile status? Well, it was created in part because the state of California had large populations of children without status, and they had them in their state foster care system. They may have come across them in abusive situations, abandoned families, labor trafficking. They take them into care, educate them, clothe them, house them, and then at age, age 18 had no path to regularize their status. And so a delegation California is a very populous state representing a lot of members of Congress. Delegation began to advocate within Congress, particularly in, the, in five key states, Florida, Texas, California, and New York, and um, New Jersey, to say, you have large populations of children out of status that are in your traditional juvenile protection system. They should have a path toward regularizing their status. Now, Congress only gave this to children who are in foster care or status because of abuse, neglect, or abandonment by a parent. And originally the law said it had to be both parents. But there was an amendment that began to say only one parent. The child must be first adjudicated in our state government system. We are a federal society where our states are our sovereign autonomy to cover most domestic family law. Immigration law has no uniform family court or child court. Our federal system has no such process. So the child, if they find themselves in New York or in California, must first go through that state's procedure to have an adjudication of abandonment, neglect, um, abuse, and that's defined by that local jurisdiction standards. And if that judge makes a finding, that is the only place in all of our immigration law where the best interests of the child are to be considered. But that family court judge, that juvenile judge, can adjudicate that child would not have their best interests served by return from the country of origin. With that certificate from the state court, the child can then petition to the government to be qualified as a special juvenile immigrant. Now that's an incredibly generous program. And if the state recognizes your status up to the age of 21, the federal statute does as well. While 18 is the age of majority for most purposes, such as the draft, the military, voting, 21 for alcohol consumption, and 21 for most immigration categories, not all, but most. Most people didn't even know this special immigrant juvenile status visa existed. In 2006, when I began doing this work, the quota had never been reached because while Congress created this category, they capped it at 9,600 children a year. Today, we have perhaps, I'm hesitant, no one knows for sure, a four to 15 year backlog for children from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Our success 
at helping these children establish that their families are not intact. Quite often there's one parent in the United States. They've been abandoned by another parent or there was abuse or there was some kind of long-term um, distress with the child or death of a parent who've been so successful that because our nation also categorizes our legal immigration process with country caps, we have a delay quite often for Mexico and India in this category, telling you that there are Mexican youth and there are people from India at navigating this. We've come close in some years with the country of Haiti and for El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala, we, the advocacy community groups like the nonprofit I founded, Safe Passage Project, we've created a backlog. Now, happily, the immigration enforcement prosecutors have come to the position that while this is not an immediate relief that could end a removal hearing, and by the way, we place all apprehended children into our deportation system, which we call removal, um, they will close the administrative case, not forcing the child to continue to return to court as long as they, the court receives updates that the child is in the queue for adjustment to permanent status. This special immigrant juvenile status is not something that can be adjudicated from overseas. It is easier than our asylum system. It's not easy, but it is much easier than our asylum system. Because as Jacqueline mentioned a minute ago, the majority of the children fleeing from South America, if you ask them to articulate their fear, they are can. By the way, 40% of the children are between the ages of 15 and 16. 29% are under the age of 15, and about 33% are age 17. We don't have data past that, because if you're 18, you're treated as an adult if, at apprehension. If these children, you ask them, why are you afraid? Why can you not return to your country? They'll talk about the extortion their family um, had to pay, the money, they call it la renta, the rent, to keep these organized criminal syndicates away from the daughter and the family or from themselves. The gang problem has grown exponentially in Central America and one of the key factors of its growth was our 1996 immigration statutes which deported even lawful residents if they were involved in criminal activity. We exported the children of El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras who had grown up in our cities, primarily Los Angeles and Washington DC were the main sources. And the gang names are even the same names that come from our cities. The FBI has written reports that we've created one of the world's largest criminal syndicates. These criminal syndicates are also of course, in part funded by participating in drug trafficking, but not always. And where is the drug habit larger than in the United States? So these children are victims of our domestic policy, of our deportation policy, and of their own society's inability to protect them. One would think an asylum adjudicator would recognize these as a, a particular social group, but the courts have been extremely resistant saying that coming from generalized crime in your society is not a well-founded fear of persecution on account of a protected ground. So we advocates switched to making sure we could put the clothes like the boat is full or put the family member in a different situation. Again, not falsely, but we switched to arguments such as this child is at risk because he will be persecuted in order to get the family to pay money or this child is at risk of sexual assault. Women in particular in Honduras often are taken as the property of the gang. That's what they say to the girl, you're mine now and you belong to the gang. And an initiation right often involves, um, I'm sorry to be so graphic, but gang rape and large number of males raping the female to force her into submission. Some of these cases are indeed granted. Our little nonprofit, which is representing over a thousand children now, we have a very high win rate, but we have a very high success rate. We don't then generate published opinions. When someone wins before our asylum office, there's no reported decision. 
So the non-transparency is another issue just with inside our legal systems. If you're trying to do research as an academic, such as Jason has done or others have done, you can't find reported cases articulating the successful strategies. We have succeeded with young people talking about imputed political opinion because we've brought in anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists to show that the societies in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and other places, Ecuador is a growing problem, know that these criminal syndicates are part of a corrupt legal regime. Some of you may know, for example, several presidents in Guatemala have been indicted and convicted of corruption. We argue then that the children in resisting the gang recruitment or participation in the gang are doing the best to articulate their political resistance. How does a child manifest political resistance at age 12, but with their feet walking away? turning away and fleeing. We've also been successful in having many children receive a grant of asylum based on religious persecution. Not quite as significantly as large. And you might think, well, what, are, what do I know about these countries? Um, there is a large growth of evangelical Christians in these tormented societies. And this could be true in any part of the world where you might have a kind of fundamentalist uh, Islamic faith, or you might see a renewal in a, a devotion to Hinduism or Sikhism because you're living in a society that is falling apart. And when you try to be an upstanding follower of the moral tenets of your religion, and you're seen going to Bible study at the Seventh-day Adventist church on a Saturday, where you're carrying your Bible and talking about the Protestant vision of heaven versus Catholicism. One young man who succeeded ultimately but after an appeal carried his Bible bravely to the gang and said, you go to mass on Saturday and you seek absolution, but Jesus won't give you true absolution when your crimes are so heinous if you just commit them again on Monday. And he was beaten, his Bible was torn apart, he was urinated upon. And they said if he, if, they, if he ever dared to do this again, he would be killed. He went to his pastor who helped him navigate through a series of churches. And after a four month journey, arrived in the United States. His case took over two and a half years in the adjudicatory process. So does the Refugee Convention fit children? The US, I've written articles in which I say, we can't take a grown-up's overcoat and cut it down to size. We force children to appear in immigration court even at the tender age of no verbal communication. We are doing better at providing some free counsel for them, but the limits on the contracts and the grants limit the scope of the legal representation. And the young or experienced lawyers who are representing these youth are burning out resigning in under two years because of the vicarious trauma. Many of them have quit. Many of the nonprofits have refused to engage in the government contracts because of the constraints, because they cannot treat the child holistically and all their needs, nor follow the case through to completion. The size of our country, size and enforcement and po frozen politics of our system make it really impossible to create perfect solutions. Let me give you some more numbers. These children are all put into the immigration removal court system, yet the immigration judges have no authority to grant them immediate protection. The prosecutors cannot house them. They cannot feed them. They cannot ensure they're in school. Housing, food, and schooling in the United States are primarily the responsibility of the individual states. So if you're fortunate enough to live in a state such as New York, a child under 19 can enroll in a, in a very low cost healthcare system. The child can attend school, but even in New York, our state government had to take over the control of six different school districts because they were taking the children and putting them in the basketball court and giving them an hour of school and saying it met the minimum conditions. So again, you can have a legal right, but the reality of how that right is exercised 
can be very frustrated. So they're all in this immigration court system. How big is it? New York is the largest court. There are approximately 48 different courts. Some are inside our detention center. Some are electronic now, run completely by video conferencing out of Virginia and Texas. There are 1.6 million people in our system. And many of those people are families. And the court recently was criticized because even in releasing their data pursuant to our statutes require the release of governmental data, so many errors were found in the coding of the cases that the main organization, an organization called TRAC, T-R-A-C at Syracuse.edu, no longer will report how many juveniles are in the system because the data is so inherently unreliable because the coding of the cases by the staff and the prosecutor is so flawed. 1.6 million cases, how many immigration judges do we have? Fewer than 300. And then to make it even more complex, as I said, the judges are not empowered to grant that special immigrant juvenile status relief I talked about where you go to family court. They can't do that family court adjudication. They can't appoint counsel for the child. And they don't hear the asylum claim in the first instance if the young person is under 18. The court closes the proceeding temporarily and tells the child, go to an asylum office. We only have eight asylum offices in the United States. They have over 600,000 pending cases. We don't know how many of those cases are juveniles because they don't report that data. My estimate would be that there's probably at least 50,000 juvenile cases pending. Why not prioritize those juvenile cases? The government has not done that. Instead, we just added 90,000 Afghans, thank goodness that we rescued over 90,000 Afghan people. And the government has been told by Congress and its funding, you will prioritize those cases. Meaning that the children, some of whom have had cases pending two or three years before the Asylum Bureau will now wait longer. Why does our government constantly change its priorities on which cases they'll adjudicate because there is a strong philosophy within Washington DC and the heads of these agencies that delay incentivizes fraud. And so we must rapidly adjudicate the most recently arriving cases. In the Afghan situation, it's to try to give these people some kind of permanency and status. We brought them into the company, country on something called parole, which is just a temporary status. But we don't put sufficient resources or energy into the adjudication. And if you're a young person who lives, for example, in New Mexico, you might have to travel to Anaheim, California. That's about, oh, I think I'm going to guess 800 miles for your interview, which will occur at 8.30 in the morning and maybe take four to five hours. And yes, you can bring counsel, but only at your own expense. But even when counsel goes with you to this all important interview, they are not to speak. We sit and take notes. So I have been in the room with the asylum officer as he looks at an eight year old and says, tell me, you're seeking asylum because you believe your opinion creates a nexus with a protected ground. What is your nexus? And the little girl points to her belly button and says, my nexus is here. And he says, no, that is your navel. And I interrupt and I say, officer, could we rephrase? Could she simply tell you why her grandmother told her she had to leave? And he said, well, I'm obligated by my agency to articulate the nexus. Generalized conditions are insufficient. The burden is on each applicant to show that they have art deserve protection on account of a particular ground. Actually, that little girl was fantastic. She'd been well prepared. And she told the, the uh, uh, asylum officer, I want to grow up in a place where a girl can walk the streets in safety and speak her mind and not let men control her body and everything she does. And even in school, they only call on the boys. 
and I'm not going to be quiet. I can't live in a country where I can't be an astronaut. We win that case. But is it reported? It is not. Can you cite it as precedent? You cannot. So advocates and academics, we have to keep training and training the community of people willing to work in this field. And there's not enough of us. There's a great need. If you are from the US and watching this, please volunteer. The Safe Passage Project in New York or Kids in Need of Defense across the country, or you can do research and find a local organization where you can start getting involved in just doing the work yourself. There's excellent materials on the Safe Passage Project website. There's a manual on children. Um, for some of you who want to go deeper, there's a manual explaining the process for children seeking asylum and best practices. And of course, you can also surely donate to Safe Passage well, to support the work of the lawyers who do all this pro bono. What a, so a lot of respect for your organization. So I know we're running out of time. I just wanted to close maybe with one other concept which we've touched upon here. In the US, when a young person becomes authorized to remain, becomes a permanent resident, they can later seek naturalization. And assuming they haven't had any criminal bar of activity or they're not a terrorist and that they've learned enough English to be basically conversant, they can pass a, a not too difficult test on American history and government. When they become a citizen and they're over the age of 21, they can immediately sponsor their parent. So we do have perhaps another incentive for some families to indeed send their children to the United States with this dream that maybe one day the child will secure status and sponsor them. But notice all that I'm talking about doesn't really help the thousands and thousands. In New York State, an estimated 700,000 alone of young people who have lived almost all their lives in the United States. Because our statutes also contain many permanent barriers. If you were brought to this country as a six month old, whether you're in an intact family now or not, there's no way for you to regularize your status except as a victim of a particularly serious crime in the United States. And the queue for that category is backlogged more than 10 years. If you leave the country, you'll be subject to a minimum of a 10 year bar before you can return. And so you've heard about our dreamers, you've heard that our legislature perhaps has passed legislation creating a path of regularizing status. But what you may not know is because the US is not a signatory to the conventions of the right of the child, nor a signatory to the International Convention on Human Rights, we have no complementary provisions such as section eight, which uh, Jason was talking about. The idea of your entire family life would be destroyed. So surely the immigration adjudicator has the authority to leave you intact. We leave you intact, but without status. We use prosecutorial discretion and you may live with a, a vagueness of your head, no formal document, documentation. You might receive a work permission, but never a path to full status, to licensure in many professions, to citizenship. Our Supreme Court has said repeatedly that although the due process clause of our constitution can apply to people, not citizens within our territory, there is no substantive power to cut off the power of the sovereign to detain. Until you become a citizen, you are vulnerable to deportation. And even if you become a citizen, if we find there was any fraud or deception or criminal conduct that was not disclosed, we can denaturalize and deport again. So the United States is unique because of our size and the volume unique because we offer some complementary protection, but the process is not fitting in children at all. However, I wanna say I'm well aware, I'm not naive, that if we created a better process, within a few weeks, it would probably soon become overwhelmed. And so it needs to constantly be like an ecosystem of evolutionary awareness. And what I would wish for were leaders in government that would create systems of adaptability and responsiveness and prioritize the well-being of children 
versus an abstract concept of deterrence. I hope that was helpful to the audience. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, dear all of you, because uh, that gives a lot of information and uh, anger <laughs> when we listen to that. So therefore, my very first question, um, we have to finish in 10 minutes as Jacqueline and Jason have to quit then. So we have uh, some few minutes. So tip in your questions and comments quickly. And I just want to ask you, Lenny and Jacqueline, so what is the perspective for the children uh, in the next months and years to come? So they cannot stay in this situation. So what is UNHCR doing? What is the Biden administration trying to change? So perhaps you can give us a little bit of perspective. Is there, is there any hope that this mass detainment of children will stop? Well, the government will tell you, we only detain children on average 37 days. When you, when you have an average number, of course, it's very deceptive. We do indeed release children as quickly as we can if they have a qualified sponsor for release in the United States. And if one simply Googles unaccompanied minor child program, mm -hmm. HHS, you can read the sponsor agreement. This is not a formal process of guardianship or foster care or adoption, but we do release the majority of children. What the Biden administration is doing, and I've recently had some very, very productive phone calls with high up levels there, uh -huh. is more funding to provide more legal services. Okay. But I think, as I said, if they don't loosen up on the constraints with those organizations that will contract with them, they may find no willing takers, even of federal funds. Mm. Um, as far as UNHCR, I know they, they were trying to work for safety for the children inside of Mexico as well, but perhaps Jacqueline would like to respond. Yeah, I don't. I don't have um, anything much to add. I think that um, there is a kind of a tension, and, and Lenny knows the kind of intricacies best than I do. I think there's a tension within the Biden administration. On the one hand, you know, there was a great sense of sigh of relief after, you know, the previous administration lost the election and the new administration came in and a sense that from, um, you know, migrant rights mm -hmm. perspective, things were going to improve dramatically. And then there has been the kind of debate about you know the disappointments some mm -hmm. people argue well behind the scenes they have actually reversed a lot of the bad decisions that the, the previous administration made and certainly there have been some changes and others argue you know it's a glass half empty glass half full situation others argue yes but it's very inadequate there are still egregious um conduct which is really completely in conflict with the claims and the promises that the administration that the candidates made you know prior to being voted into office. So I think it's an, I think there's a lot of political sensitivity. My own view is that it's extremely slow and that this is one of the areas where the, the president has decided he's not going to stick his neck out, um, you know, by appointing uh, Vice President Kamala Harris to be the person with um, responsibility. This is not really something that she's an expert on. She doesn't speak Spanish. It's a, a kind of way of shoving the discussion out of the out of the kind of fast lane. So I think that's very disappointing. Um, and I think that, you know, UNHCR, I know, you know, excellent UNHCR colleagues in DC are trying hard. Um, but of course, you know, there, there are negotiations behind the scenes. I think that nothing is going to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, and we haven't talked about this, but you know, if you think about the large number of undocumented children in the US who you know, came here as babies, um, how long it's taking for that to change? Yeah. I mean, yeah. these are not refugees. Yeah. These are long-term residents. I mean, they are citizens in all but, in all but law. <laughs> um, but we still haven't even that what some people refer to as low hanging fruit, we haven't even managed to, to clinch that. So I'm not optimistic. I think that um, given the political challenges that this administration is facing and the political climate in this country, we are not going to see dramatic improvements. And I, I find it a very depressing prospect, uh, despite you know some of the, the changes. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, I think this is a problem we are facing globally at the moment in regard to refugees. So uh, I, I, I wish we can fight all together so that the policies might change. So the justice system is, a, is an angle of uh, saving people in a way, legally, but the policies have to change. And therefore, thank you also to, for presenting the situation in the UK and in the US. Uh, because this is so important to understand that we are in this sense in the same situation. So here's a comment from the audience and then I know that you have to uh, finish the webinar, but I, at least I want to share this comment with you. So I think this 37 days is deceptive. Many at times caseworkers are unable to ascertain the safety of these sponges that the children are released to. It is definitely not in the best interest of the child when caseworkers are given a limited time frame to make such an assessment. Um, this same, uh, there's another person that wants to share a training on asylum law. Yeah. Uh, and that was you, you who sent it. Yes, of course, we can share it with all together. So I put the link here on to everybody, or you already did it. Jackie, no, it, just, thank you. it just goes to the participants. I mean, it goes to the panel, I believe. So now, now it went to all participants. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, children in detention as being protection. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different forms of this detention. Children are held at border patrol stations for up to 72 hours. They're sometimes held in these tent camps. They were horribly held in hotels with people who didn't know how to take care of them. There's room for about 20,000 children through contracted, and they're not all excellent uh, facilities that are run by nonprofits that have some skills in housing children. So here in New York, there's more than 15,000 children in varieties of detention, and some of that is long-term. Mm -hmm. We also have some high security detention centers where if children misbehave inside the center, become suicidal, or are perceived as uh, smugglers themselves, uh, criminals, they might be in a kind of a criminal juvenile detention. The problem uh, with rapidly processing the children and releasing them into adults, 95% of these children are released to a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or uncle, or an older sibling, a sibling that's over the age of 18. Um, there have been some very isolated cases of where the child was victimized by the person they were released to, and it's really a small number. Mm -hmm. But the government then hides behind that to justify delays. and most of the people coming forward to secure the release of the children are undocumented or irregular migrants in themselves. So it takes bravery or that family finding someone who's brave enough to do it. Um, the Trump administration began to terrorize the people who are coming forward to seek the release and threaten to prosecute them for smuggling. If you are deemed civil law to have paid for a child's journey to the United States to enter unlawfully, even to seek asylum, it can be a crime or it can be a lifetime bar to your own immigration. So it's such a conundrum, you know, do, is, is it better to be detained or not? But here's one other thing I want the European audience in particular to know, we are not a social democratic republic. We are a laissez-faire, hard times, capitalist republic. We have 65,000 homeless people in New York City every night. People sleep in subways, people go to churches, people go to soup kitchens. And so in some ways, when I speak about this to an <laughs> audience of civilians, they will say, but what about the children we're not taking care of in our own society? No. We don't have very generous support. And in some ways, I don't want to minimize it. Some of the support we're giving to the unaccompanied minors is more protection than we're giving to many people in our society. I'm really thankful to all of you for this important discussion, and I hope we all stay in touch to further raise our voices loud for the rights of children. And being here, Jason, please tell your child happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish everybody of you a nice day, a nice evening. Thank you, uh, JP, also for your support. And I hope we stay in touch all together. Thank you so much.